All right. The path of the modern from the years 1945 to 1959. Now this lecture is basically going to cover how uh, Texas um, was affected by the post-war boom. And needless to say, in some areas we did quite well, and in other areas, even though they needed work, we were working on them. Now first off, what are we doing in the post-war boom? Well guys, more and more, Texas is getting into manufacturing. Indeed, in oil and petrochemical products, we go from producing 50% of the nation's petrochemicals in 1945 to 80% by 1960, in aeronautics, North American is still producing aircraft and opening up plants, as is Beller Aircraft in their location near Fort Worth. And we become the second largest producer of airplanes in the nation, being surpassed only by uh, California. Also, as Houston is chosen as the headquarters for NASA, or the National Aeronautical Space Administration. It should come as no surprise that we are big players there. Next, electronics. Even though most of the electronics um, at the beginning, most of the electronics um, businesses that are going on are going on in Houston, a young and up and coming company called Texas Instruments soon starts taking over. Now it's interesting because Texas Instruments actually got its beginnings as an oil exploration company that basically used GIS or geographical information systems to find oil below the ground. Well during World War II they used their uh, abilities to assist uh, the U.S. Navy in sonar. And then at the war's end, they started developing transistors. There's an image of one of the first transistors they built. Now before this, they only had like uh, tubes that got hot, had low capacities, weren't really that reliable. But transistors, which were built on silicon, could amplify and rectify current or voltage, controlling the electronic current between terminals.
in food processing. We're the third largest food processor in the nation. And even though for non-national companies, they didn't really make a lot of inroads, for national companies though, like Bell, like North American, labor unions were 60% of the jobs were mem uh, in those national companies, 60% of those hired were a member of labor unions. Indeed, if you go to work for a national union, that, I mean a national chain or corporation that uh, has locations in union states, you could be a union worker. For example, if you work for American Airlines, you could be a union worker at Kroger. You can be a union worker. Meanwhile, in agriculture, well, guys, ever since uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's changes to agriculture, as well as the subsidization of farms, you're seeing more and more farming being done by large companies and not so much by the mom and pops. Indeed, by 1960, farmers are only one-sixth of the state's population. Which you could say that's almost one out of five but for what a uh, huge farming land we were, that's quite a change. Now, what's getting people out of the farming industry? Well, things like the uh, mechanical cotton picker that did the work of 40 men. Of course, you had to be able to afford it. That's where the large companies come in. Also, now that we have not only fertilizers, but herbicides that can kill off weeds, you no longer have to hire workers or ex expend labor clearing out the weeds in a crop patch. But it is still quite a valuable industry here in Texas, as by 1960, the state of Texas makes $2 billion out of our agriculture. Of course, one of the things that your book didn't talk about, and if you've driven out in rural Texas, it's kind of sad to see that some of the farming, I mean, you can see this in East, East, West, South, everywhere. Especially if they were a large farming community, you'll see like these deserted downtowns that are frozen in the 1950s. Because people come back to the war, they've got a lot of money, they want to open up a restaurant, they want to open up a hardware store, they want their little community to thrive. But opportunities aren't being found out in rural areas. And you're having a lot of people move to the cities. So you'll see a lot of these county seats, especially, like they're frozen in time. And if you go out to West Texas, it's funny. Because like Jacksboro, which is the uh, county seat of Jack County, that's a county that has oil. So they've got some nice looking buildings. And downtown, still a little bit thriving. There are some places out of work, but they got oil and gas money. Meanwhile, the next county over, no oil and gas play. It's not looking good. Post 
more urbanization and suburbanization. In 1940, we had 4 million people here. By 1960, we've exploded to 7.7 .7 million. Indeed, according to the 1950 census, there are more Texans living in the cities than in the countryside. Now, for the rest of America, that was the 1920 census. But it becomes a reality to us in 1950. Indeed, according to the 1970 census, our largest 10 cities in Texas have 80% of the population of Texas. Of course, you also have a disparity in that the Anglos are doing better than um, the Tejanos or African Americans. But one group that's actually um, holding on to their own a little is women. They're keeping their jobs. But because this is kind of the age of conformity, either you're one of us or you're one of the commies, people don't talk about it that much. Well, some do, and we'll get to those. Indeed, more and more people are moving out to suburbia. Why are they moving out to the suburbs? Well, because uh, their land is cheaper out there. The government and uh, banks are offering cheap loans, as well as the construction of highways. It's allowing people the mobility where they can move out to the suburbs escape the city, yet still rely on the city for, like, jobs and sustenance. However, whites do this to a much greater degree because they can afford it. Indeed, some housing authorities did not allow members of other than the Caucasian race to live in their neighborhood. <laughs> now, know, however, that we're not just talking about uh, African Americans or Tejanos. That also includes, like, Jews. If they didn't like Jews, you couldn't live there. If they didn't like Irish, Italian, Polish. These baby boomers, are, or the parents of the baby boomers, and the baby boomers themselves, basically in the switch from a wartime to a consumer uh, economy, find themselves flooded with goods. You have like television portable radios, automobiles. Indeed, with the autom automation of the workplace, in 1945, it took, I believe, yeah, 355 hours to construct a car. By 1950, that hour rate was down to 120 because it had become so efficient.
We start to have this whole car culture in America. Songs are written about them. You can go to uh, drive-in movie theaters. Indeed, one would think that uh, if we had a lot of drive-in movie theaters today, you'd probably still see this. They used to have church services at drive-in movie theaters on Sunday morning, where people would drive in, sit in their car, listen to the radio. Because of COVID, there's a lot of those still happen. Well, we don't have as many drive-ins as we used to, though. Of course, also, that's how Joe Biden did a lot of his electioneering. But like I told you guys, Americans were doing well. Homeownership on the whole increased 50%. And the increased production I was telling you about in the uh, factories wasn't just limited to cars. We had a huge variety. And not just one type of car. We had tons of different cars you could choose from. We had tons of different radio players. Tons of different portable radios. Tons of different televisions. And speaking of television, in 1946, we had 7,000 kind of scratchy black and white TV sets that are sold with just a few television stations. By 1960, we've got more than 50 million. And within a few more years, people will be getting the color TVs. Ooh. And the most popular periodical of the 1950s was TV Guide. Tell you what the TV shows are going to be. Indeed, it was so funny. City engineers noted that about every 15 minutes, there'd be a flurry of water activity where the water pressure would just dump. And then, after about three minutes, the water pressure would go back to being normal. And 15 minutes later, it would dump. Again. This is in cities across the nation. Do y'all know what that could possibly be? Commercial breaks. Yeah, commercial breaks. Time to go to the restroom. You have increased pur uh, purchasing. going throughout society. For middle class wives, now weekly trips to the beauty parlor, parlor was common. You could go to your outdoor mall or strip mall. Indeed, the head of the AFL-CIO, George Meany, the AFL is the American Federation of Labor, uh, Labor Union. He said, American labor has never had it so good. What about African-American earnings? Well, African-American earnings did quadruple from their 1945 earnings however many still found themselves behind
Now, one thing that was actually bringing people together, well, I'll get back to that in a little while. Cultural effects, you start to have shopping centers, those kind of outdoor malls, the strip malls, that are becoming popular. You even had two investors <coughs> that bought some land that was near a wealthy section of town, even though it wasn't in it proper. It was right on the outskirts. Larger city was kind of growing towards it. They put all of it inside a huge shopping mall. And it was all air conditioned. And this thing was a total gamble that the wealthy of the city that lived nearby would come out and shop there. Does anybody here know what the first indoor air conditioned shopping mall in America was? North Park. North Park Mall down by uh, University Park and Highland Park. What's, uh, uh, what's the effect on income, well, I mean on kids? Well now guys, kids have a disposable income. With an allowance of anywhere from eight to 40 bucks a month. Some people began to describe the American family as a child centered anarchy. And it was into this morass that a DJ by the name of Alan Freed started a music craze. He got albums that was traditionally known as race music because they were either by black or Tejano singers. He started playing it at night and he called it rock and roll. And of course, basically this new music, as well as the teens uh, taking to it, was an unprecedented entertainment of identity, racially, ethnically, class-wise. It was the one thing that could join everybody. Even allowing one young truck driver who was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, basically, to get his own kind of rockabilly music, mix of country and rock, and basically go out in his scantily tight blue jeans and his jacket. Indeed, his first appearance on television was so dangerous that they only shot him from the waist up when he was on the Ed Sullivan show. It was Elvis Presley. Now, who was it that Elvis Presley looked up to? Well, it was a guy from the little town of Wink, Texas, Roy Orbison, who Elvis Presley called the most uh, talented singer in the world. He basically went to North Texas State College Dropped out after two years. Even though he had started a country and western group in high school, calling themselves the Wink Westerners. They signed up with the Sun record label, the same record label that made Elvis Presley 
Jerry Lee Lewis so famous? But then dropped out. He wrote a song, Claudette, that the Everly Brothers, a big rock, uh, rockabilly band, bought. They kind of gave him some fame. He then went on to write hits like Only You, Blue Angel, Blue Bayou. Pretty Woman. But it's time, by the time we hit the 60s, it's kind of sad because his second wife dies in a motorcycle accident in 1966, and three of his sons are killed in a house fire in 1968. The next Texas star is Charles Harden Holly. Anybody know what his name is? Know what his nickname is? You don't know what his nickname is? He wrote Peggy Sue. Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly was born out in Lubbock. Uh... At 11, he took piano lessons, quit after nine months, studied steel guitar. At junior high school, he formed a country and western band. He even was able to sign up with Decca Records. And that kind of floundered. He returned to Lubbock, determined to uh, make his name in music. He and his friend uh, form a band called the Crickets. And when he comes out with songs like That'll Be The Day, I'm Looking For Someone To Love, it started reaching like number three on the charts. He gets a manager, and his manager makes tours for him out in the east. But the people who heard his records thought that he was black. So he like had spots at the Apollo, the historic Apollo Theater in Harlem that he received a very cold reception to uh, until his third day when he had a, a Bo Diddley kind of tribute. And that took off. Of course, in uh, January of 1959, all of that came to an end when he was on a plane with Richie Valens. Uh, J.P. Uh, Richardson, who was the big bopper, and several others. Waylon Jennings was supposed to take that flight with him. But he got a phone call that made him delay. Anyway, the flight takes off and the plane crashes, killing all those inside. Which was turned into a song, The Day the Music Died. All right, Tejano and civil rights in the 1950s. Okay, Ricardo Garcia, that I told you about, who had won the uh, Medal of Honor by Truman for his actions in World War II. He was born in Mexico, and he came over. His family came over here to Texas, settling in Sugarland, a town near Houston. And he went to a restaurant at Richmond, a few miles south of Houston, where he was refused to be served, which of 
of course, he took incredible umbrage at. And LULAC, council number 60, came in to fight for him. And eventually, uh, Garcia became an American citizen. Next is the case of Felix Longoria, a guy who had volunteered, a Tejano who had volunteered for a mission in the Philippines in the final days of World War II. He never came back. His body was found in 1948. And his father had bought him a grave site at this cemetery in the Mexican section, because it was separated by barbed wire from the other sections, the Anglo section, the black section. And his wife wanted to have the wake at the funeral home, which they totally refused to do. And it's curious because the owner of the um, funeral home, the director of the funeral home served in World War II. And his reason for saying it is because the whites wouldn't like it. Now, of course, uh, news of this goes all the way up to LBJ, who was in Congress at that time. LBJ offered to have him buried in Arlington National Cemetery. To which the family said no. <clears throat> Another big case was Hernandez v. the state of Texas, where Hernandez had been caught murdering a fellow Tejano. Yet, no Tejanos were allowed at the trial. Uh -oh. And basically, the Texas Supreme Court ruled that, in, uh, in the case of Hernandez v. Texas, that one had the right to be tried and indicted by a jury from which members of his class were not disqualified. And as time continued to progress, more and more the doors were open for Tejano participation. And Henry B. Gonzalez was the first Tejano in the modern age that was elected up to San Antonio Councilman. In the way back after our revolution, we had like Lorenzo de Zavala as vice president. We had um, Juan Seguin, who was mayor of San Antonio, as well as a senator. Right. Meanwhile, the NAACP is busy here in Texas. We have the case of Herman Marion Sweat, who attended uh, racially segregated schools. He attended Wiley College in Marshall, where he earned an undergraduate degree in 1934. 
and he decided to uh, attend the University of Texas's School of Law, challenging our separate but equal. Basically, UT had six months to build a separate law school. Which they weren't even able to do. They, they uh, put in all this money to start the Texas State University for Negroes. Which later on became another college, I forgot which. Anyway, when, uh, after the six months, when the semester is to begin, basically uh, Painter, that's the president of the University of Texas, Theodopolis Painter, they only had like a room in a basement that uh, Sweat was allowed to go to. That's where different faculty would come in and teach Herman Sweat. He, of course, refuses to do that. We get the case of uh, Sweat v. Painter, which challenged segregation. And even though it came four years before Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which was successful, Sweat v. Painter was unsuccessful. And segregated schools were perpetuated. but it still served as a mighty blow. Well, how did the dissent after the Brown v. the Board of Education, how did that go here in Texas? Well, the very first school that was uh, desegregated was out at a small Texas town, Friona, in the middle of the Texas panhandle. A black family had moved to their community. They had five kids. The school was integrated with little problems. By 1955, you have desegregated schools in San Angelo, El Paso, San Antonio. So schools in the south and west of Texas Oh, by the way, Fiona, Fiona actually desegregated, I, what was the year I told you? Fiona actually uh, desegregated in 1952. So before Brown be, be the Topeka Board of Education even. Was everybody so ready? No. Mansfield, little community uh, west of Fort Worth. When they were told they had to desegregate, they hung up an effigy of a black man from their school that uh, stayed hanging for several days. Of course, you have kids, we want segregation, we don't want niggers, niggers stay home. So basically what the community did is they paid for school buses to take their uh, black students 20 minutes away to a school in Fort Worth that was desegregated. 
And I believe Mansfield wouldn't be segregated until like 1976. Well, how did our state respond? Well, in 1957, the legislature denied funding for schools that integrated without district approval. And just as the case uh, Brown v. Topeka Board of Education, they said that schools were to desegregate with all deliberate speed. Basically, that gave communities the time to make the change that they wanted to. So they allowed excuses to avoid integration, like transportation problems or lack of space. Due to this, by 1964, only 18,000 to 325,000 attended integrated schools. Meanwhile, in colleges and universities, they actually were better at integration than the public schools were. In 1952, again, before Brown versus the, before it's ordered, MRU and Del Mar College near Corpus Christi, they've integrated. In 1955, Texas Western University, that would become the University of Texas at El Paso, has integrated. One year later, UT, Austin, and Southern Methodist University have integrated. And by 1958, two-thirds of Texas's colleges and universities are integrated. All right, we'll have fun talking politics next time. We've reached the 45, my friends. <laughs>